So today we're going to talk muskrat skinning, fleshing, and stretching. Um, I'm going to show you kind of the basics of what we do and why we do it and explain a little bit of our background. Uh, when we're skinning muskrats, uh, we like them to be dry. We like them to be basically two days from the time they're caught. So if, they, if you catch them today, we don't like to skin them today. We like to catch spit, skin them tomorrow because they skin easier. They loosen up. You lose a rigor mortis and they become easier to skin. Muskrats are very thin skinned and uh, it's pretty easy to tear them if you don't know what you're doing. They're like a possum would be or like a red fox. You got to kind of be careful. They're thinner skinned than like a coyote or a raccoon. Um, we wear um, those gloves or the nitro gloves. We wear those on the bottom um, just like a surgeon would be at, at, would do. And then we also wear the cotton gloves over the top like you see that I have on right now, kind of like a butcher. So we cut from ankle to ankle across the back on the bottom side, just like you're seeing. And again, this is how we do it. We're not saying it's the only way. This is not the appropriate knife. This is a serrated knife. You actually want a smooth one. Flip it over and then you cut up the tail, the back. And then I'm gonna do a little peeling job here. That's the only two cuts we make to start with. So we peel back a little bit with your thumbs is what you use. You just kind of work the hide away from the actual meat and you kind of go around the leg and you pull that out and you kind of turn it around there and you stick your fingers through and you give it a pull and then we're going to pull the back up over the top of the head and stuff the head through just like a sock basically so you sit it on his butt just give it a stuff stuff it through and then you just kind of pull with your thumbs pull all that away again there's no cutting you just pull all the way you get all the way to the legs the front legs and then you pull you put your thumb in you pull the front leg out put your other thumb in pull that leg out and the next thing you do is you're going to cut an ear right there and then you're going to cut another ear right there and then you're going to cut a little bit on the side of the jowl kind of on the jaw a little bit there and if you put a little pressure on it some people will put spikes down and they'll stab the carcass onto it so they can pull a little there's one eye and uh, then you're going to cut across you're going to get the other eye a sharp knife is nice then you're going to cut on the side of the mouth right there right there and then over there and then you're going to pull out to the end of the nose and you cut it off and that's about how long it takes if we're really going fast kenny can skin one probably a little faster than me i think he can do it in about 20 seconds or so and i can do it about 25 maybe 30 seconds um, we have done a lot of muskrat skinning now we started together trapping muskrats when we were kids I was eight, he was seven, and we trapped in central Wisconsin on the Wisconsin River in some ponds around our house. And uh, the, the very first year we trapped, uh, it was 1970, what would that have been? I gotta think here now, 71? Does that make sense, 71? Right around there, 70 or 71, I think was the first year we trapped. Our grandpa was a professional trapper, so he taught us a little bit but didn't teach us too much because he was old school and you don't give up secrets. Um, but he did give us a few traps, told us some basics, and we kind of learned on our own. Um, we trapped all the way through high school together. And in the late 70s, when the fur prices were high, Kenny and I would each make $1,000 trapping. Our parents would let us take off school and everything to trap muskrats because we were making more money trapping muskrats than the average adult was making. Um, for a day's wages for us trapping muskrats. They were worth anywhere from $8 to $10 a piece back then, and we would catch 100, 150 of them every fall. Um, and uh, so yeah, I'm just, again, you can see the opening cut just kind of going all the way through from the bottom and then up, and then we're gonna do the same thing on the back, one little cut there. Now some guys will sit down and hold the muskrat between their knees and skin. Kenny does that, and he's actually good at it. And that's how his son Jed skins also. I like to stand up. I don't like to sit down because my back starts hurting after a couple hours. Oh, we lost some guts there. That happens, especially when you catch them in a 330. Now these were caught in beaver traps uh, because we were beaver trapping. So we only caught a few muskrats. And uh, so you do it, catch a lot of incidentals because the season does overlap. And even once the muskrat season is ended, you can still keep muskrats that are caught in beaver traps, which happens a lot. Um, and we catch quite a few that way, but they're not our target uh, because muskrat prices fluctuate quite a bit. And right now 
uh, when this is being recorded in nine, no, in, in, in 2024, rat prices are maybe $250, $3 a piece. When we, again, like I said, when we trapped them when we were kids, we were getting uh, seven to $10, uh, it was pretty common. And uh, we caught a lot of muskrats, some mink, and quite a few raccoons. But the muskrats were the money was made. Um, and again, like I said, our grandpa was a professional trapper, and in his best year, I think he caught right around 1,300, which as a kid, we thought that was just unreal that he caught that many. But then one year, it would have been 2008, I wanna say, um, Kenny went out west when the muskrat prices were high and the water was high everywhere. There's a lot of flooding out there, and there was muskrats everywhere. So then the next year we went out together and the first year we went out together in the fall season, we were there for about two weeks. We caught just over 2,000 muskrats. Yes, 2,000. And then that winter, I trapped by myself uh, through the ice around where I live in central Wisconsin, where we have really big muskrats. And I caught a little over 700 muskrats, 750 or 60, something like that. And then we went back out and we trapped in the spring in North Dakota of 2009, I want to say, maybe 10, one of those years. And we caught 3,000 muskrats in less than two weeks. In the springtime, you can catch them very fast, very easy. We had a, a stretch there of about a week where we were catching over 300 a day. I think our best day was 376 or something like that. I know it was less than 400. It was right up in that range. and. Uh, yeah, we caught a lot of muskrats. They were just everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. City streets, highways. Um, we were having people flagging us down the side of the road. Hey, please come trap them in our yard. Our dog killed 10 of them last night, that kind of thing. <laughs> they were just everywhere. Uh, a lot of the, the sloughs there uh, flooded, and what happened was cattails were growing everywhere in farm fields, in corn fields, and so the muskrat population just exploded. So now I'm taking some... Uh, muskrats that were stretched already, uh, I'm gonna take them off the stretchers. And you can see on the bottom there, there was clothespins. We use those to hold the bottom skirt edge so that it doesn't slide up. And uh, we use clothespins on the nose sometimes too to hold the nose from peeling up. Now these are small rats. These are Northern muskrats, Northern Wisconsin. And uh, they don't get real big in Northern Wisconsin because they have very poor habitat, not a lot of good food. They tend to live right wherever the beaver are. So if there's a a beaver lodge or if there's a beaver pond you'll find a few muskrats here and there but definitely not large populations like we have here in central Wisconsin. Uh, I'm real close to the Horicon area so if any of you that trap you have probably heard of the Horicon area. I've never trapped Horicon but I know guys that have and I've trapped areas very close to Horicon that have that kind of population where there's muskrat houses everywhere. Um, Fall trapping is totally different than winter trapping, and winter trapping is totally different than spring trapping. Uh, but again, today, that's not what we're gonna talk about today. I'm just kinda showing you the stretching. So I'm taking these dried hides off. You know, my brother's garage, they dry very fast because he's got uh, a heated garage and he heats with wood, so they dry real quick. Now, Kenny's doing some flushing here. And uh, with muskrats, again, like I said, very tender, very thin skin. You gotta be very careful. Basically, all you do is two sides. You get them on their sides right there. So that is the left side or the right side of the muskrat. You just take that, those gland kind of jowly things off and then behind the armpit, there's a little bit of fat. You take just a little bit off. You don't want to take too much off because it gets too thin. And the fur buyers prefer it to be a little bit heavier. That saddle that is on there, that's that skin that's around the back, that is actually supposed to be left on. Um, so you just peel the fat off around the edges. Be very careful. There's a very uh, dull uh, fleshing knife. It's, doesn't, it's not sharp at all. And you're basically just kind of pushing uh, the goodies off and getting the, the, the extra meat and fat off. And then you just, that's about all the longer it takes. And he'll do another one here. And this is going slow. Like that year that we trapped out into the Dakotas where we caught thousands of them, um, we were we just skinned them and then froze them while we were out there because we were getting hundreds a day and uh, we were not selling them in the carcass and we weren't freezing them the whole. We would just skin them and then freeze them is what we did. We actually had four or five freezers out there and we just filled up the freezers because rats don't take up very much space. So that's what we did. 
and we would skin every night for a few hours and between the two of us um, it, it wasn't unusual for us to skin 300 muskrats and get them done in a couple hours. Uh, it can go pretty darn quick if you just fly through them. Two and a half hours maybe something like that. I don't remember exactly. All I know is that when we got done your hands are tired because you're setting traps all day long. Um, you are paddling in a canoe, you are jumping in and out of the canoe all day and um, it's, uh, it's a lot of work but a lot of fun. And that year when the muskrats were so plentiful out there, the reason we went is the prices were quite high. On our low end we got seven dollars because the western uh, Dakota rats aren't as good as the Wisconsin muskrats. And on our high end we got around eleven or twelve dollars, something like that. So I think our average is real close to ten. Uh, but the average we had on our Wisconsin muskrats, which are much higher quality, was much higher. Uh, I sold a batch of like 350 and I averaged 1475 and then I sold another batch of a couple hundred and my average was right around 16. Um, Kenny sold one that was $21, a single muskrat, and my best was 1950 That's the most we got for muskrat. So it's quite a bit of money. They're very easy to catch. They're very easy to skin. They're very easy to put up, which is why a lot of People go for them, a lot of kids go after them. Um, it's probably the most sought after, as far as trapping, uh, fur animal there is, as far as providing fur. It's used in a lot of different things, a lot of trimming, a lot of lining. Uh, it's used in hats and gloves and things like that. It's a very, very soft fur. For those of you that, have, uh, that haven't uh, felt it, it, it's a very soft, beautiful fur. It's not as coarse as a lot of the other furs. It's a very, very, nice fur. So he's just scraping off the chunks of uh, jowl and a little bit of fat there and then the saddle is right there, right where he's going down. You kind of got to leave that, but you got to get that little bit of fat that's underneath the armpit there because the hat, the fat is not good to leave on there. And you just scrape off basically the two sides like he's doing there. And then a little bit on the, the rear end and a little bit on the belly and that's about all there is to it. So you can see he's just a scraping away. It's very gentle. You're not pushing very hard at all. It's not like when you're flushing an otter or a coyote or a beaver where you got to really reef on them and you're basically doing push-ups. Uh, this is just real gentle sliding. Some people will use a spoon. Some people will use just a chunk of metal. I've seen people that will use a dull jackknife. I've seen people that have used a dull butter knife. Um, you can use just about anything for flushing. I like the two-handle one like Kenny's got. That's why I got the same thing. And it works really nice. So there you can see he's got the, uh, the muskrats fleshed. And he's going to go do a beaver now while I put these up. So we use wire stretchers. There are some guys that think you got to use wood stretchers. Um, you don't. Um, all the people that put up fur professionally, guys that do thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of muskrat, and the same with beaver, they use wire. They just slap them on really quick. Um, some of the guys that do beaver, that do boards, that do big volume, they use staples. They just staple them on. They don't nail them on like we do. So I'm just putting a couple clothespins on the nose. That allows you to pull it. You kind of wiggle it back and forth like I just did there. Kind of pull down on the sides. And then I like to use the hook on the, the back of the tail there. And then on the belly, there's usually a little hole where the vent is. You can give that a pull. And then I pull down a little bit on the skirts on each side. And then while I'm holding it tight there, and I don't pull too hard, you kind of got to get a feel for it. And I'll put a clothespin or two on the sides or I'll pull it down again. And again, using the gloves gives you a lot more grip. So there, it's done. It's that simple. You just make sure you got it centered. And then we're going to hang it up on a hook up above, which you'll see in just a little bit. And we're going to do another one here. Um, so yeah, just slide it on. Try to center it as best you can. Um, that's about all there is to it. And these are all winter caught muskrats, so the hides are pretty good on them. But like I said, these are not big muskrats by any means. Um, where I am in central Wisconsin here, um, kind of south, I should say central eastern part, um, kind of around the Lake Winnebago system is where I am. Um, our muskrats get really big. I've had, I've had to stretch a lot of muskrats on fox stretchers or raccoon stretchers because the, when you put them on the muskrat stretcher, which is what this is, this is the smallest stretcher, the uh, hide goes right to the bottom, all the way down. 20, 21, 22 inches. These right here are maybe 15 inches, 14, I don't know, somewhere in there. They're not big muskrats, but they're, they're good prime hides. 
Um, we just, in northern Wisconsin, they, we just don't have the cattail marshes like we do in central Wisconsin where there's a lot of uh, habitat, which is really good. There's a lot of areas that are just loaded with uh, the, the proper habitat. The one thing we found through the years, because we've been doing this for so long, is if you get a dry year or a drought year, you're going to have hardly any muskrats at all. They just have to have more habitat. And if you get a year that there's a lot of flooding up into fields or where there's a lot of new cattail growth, where the, the river bottoms or the sloughs get flooded, and uh, if you've got farms that get flooded into the fields, those are really good years for a muskrat population. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just a fun animal to catch. There's lots of them. They're easy to catch. They're, they're not too bright. Um, there's a lot of little things we've learned over the years where you can catch a lot of them and you can catch them faster and more quantity. Um, that's a whole, whole mini series of videos that we hope to do someday. We haven't been trapping them very much uh, lately over the last few years because the market's just down. Uh, right now the market is two to three dollars, maybe three and a half dollars for really big ones, four maybe. Uh, there just isn't a real high demand for it. There was for quite a while, um, but that faded away just like it did in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, muskrat and fur prices in general are really high. Right now they're low again. The only reason we go after beaver so much is there's a lot of them. Kenny's in a really good area for it, and the other reason is, is there's a huge market for it right now. The beaver fur is not used for hats like people think. It's not for beaver fur hats. It's They take the fur, shave it off, and it is used for making cowboy hats, the Stetson hats. The more high, the higher amount of uh, muskrat, or I should say beaver fur in a hat, the more the hat costs. So that's just why the price is up. And it's a stylish thing right now because of the show Yellowstone and some famous people wearing cowboy hats. So we hang them up on all those hooks there. You can see Kenny has hundreds, like four or five hundred hooks. Because when we were trapping thousands of muskrats, we would put up three, four hundred muskrats a day because they dry in a day. Take them off the stretchers and do it all over again. See all those hooks? There were a lot of times those were full of muskrats. And I have the same thing in my garage. That's it. <laughs>